Club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anita McEwitt, and it's my pleasure to be your host today as the immediate past president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land that we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We're grateful for the opportunity to be able to come together and learn on this land. So when you think about the future, can you imagine a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination? A world that is diverse, equitable and inclusive? If this is even possible, and if it is, how do we get there? According to a recent McKinsey report, although organizations have made a start on DEI, we still have a long way to go. And I'm sure that comes as no surprise to anybody. Today, in celebration of International Women's Day, our speakers will discuss how organizations can hold themselves accountable so that employees have equitable access to workplace opportunities now and in the future. Before we hear from today's panel, there are a few housekeeping matters. If you find that your internet is slow, just try hitting the click here to switch stream button. And we do want your questions today. So just click the questions tab you can enter your questions right in the window and they'll be sent to our moderator. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people together for 125 years. And it's because of our sponsors, partners and members that we're able to do so. So with that, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors, Canadian Bankers Association and McKinsey for helping to make this event possible. Thanks to the generous support of our sponsors, today's event is free of charge for all of you that are watching today. Now, to introduce today's exciting speaker lineup, we are joined by Sandrine Deviat, Senior Partner at McKinsey, Rania Llewellyn, President and CEO of Laurentian Bank of Canada, and Dr. Homer Tien, President and CEO of Orange. Today's discussion will be moderated by Shazan Shu, Strategic Advisor, and a director at the Canadian Club of Toronto. Another tradition that our club maintains is the toast that we make to our country at the start of every event. So if you have a beverage close by, please join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to Sandrine, who will start with some remarks about McKinsey's report. Sandrine, over to you. Thank you very much, Anita. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here today and talk about on this International Women's Day and talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, next one, please. McKinsey has been researching the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the past 15 years. And in all fairness, I would never have imagined I would be here today in Canada talking about this topic 15 years down the road. 
I thought, you know, as I initiated the research back in actually it was 2005 that we started thinking about that, that by now, you know, it would be a complete non-topic and we wouldn't have to meet, but such is the world we live in. When we started, you know, at the time I was leading a, what we called at the time a women initiative, we, we came a long way and uh, for Europe and uh, I attended many fora and each time, you know, I came uh, a little bit unsatisfied. On the one hand, it was amazing to meet amazing women and men, because back in Europe in 2005, it required to be really an amazing man to dare to attend those fora. But also I came a little bit wanting more because I felt that beyond the personal testimonial, I was missing a big information. You know, does it matter? Does it matter for corporations and organizations to have more women at the top? Does it matter for their performance? Does it matter for their competitivity? And as we were researching this topic, which is a multifaceted top topic, I happened to talk to the managing director at the time and he had two immediate reactions. He said, Sandrine, if nobody has done it, we should do it. And then he posed and said, oh, what are we gonna find out? If you find out that women have a negative impact. So with those encouragement, that's how we started researching the topic. And you will be happy to see that it does matter. It does matter. In the first year, we clearly demonstrated that it did matter to have more women at the top. Then in the later year, we clearly demonstrated that it did matter to have more diversity at large at the top. So uh, on the next one, please. Um, this year, you know, it's the third report that we're doing in Canada and the seventh in North America, where we focus really on how to make change matter. Um, so what did we find out this year? First and foremost, we found out that women are hanging out, but burning out. And let me share with you some facts. Next one, please. What you've seen here is the representation of women across the talent pipeline. And this is for Canada figures. So entry level, almost 50-50, all the way to C-suite, where it's more like 70-30, and to CEOs, where it's more like uh, 80 to, uh, 80 to um, sorry, 92 8 and uh, below what you have is the delta compared to when we started doing this, which was five years ago. And as you can see, while on the one hand, Canada is among the top 10 countries in terms of uh, diversity worldwide, um, the progress has stalled in the past year and it's only marginal uh, because also the companies were 100 companies more or less and they were not exactly the same. So the delta can be linked to the fact that it's not exactly the same corporation. So the progress has been stalled in the past years. So it's not a topic you know, we can declare victory. The other thing that you immediately jump to your face is the fact that to a certain extent, there's no such thing as a glass ceiling. I would say it's more a succession of very thick layers of men. Uh, because the, you know, the, at each stage of advancement, uh, the women, they fall out of the pipeline. On the next one, this year for the first time, we were able to add intersectionalities. Bear with me because it's very crude, meaning that uh, in order to make sure that the corporations will report all the numbers and considering the, you know, the system they had in place, we were only able to do for Canada of color as opposed to white. And you, we debated a long time, by the way, about the, the way we call that, it's crude, but it, it's, uh, bear with me. Um, we couldn't go you know, to have more specific uh, uh, ethnical background. But if you look at this one, you can see that um, for women of color, they entered 17% in the funnel and they drop dramatically in terms of representation. By the time we reach C-suite, it's only 6%. Uh, it is also the same to a certain, to a lesser extent for men of color. But you know, we've been demonstrating over and over that you know, the moment you have more degrees of diversity, it is harder for you to progress. This is just one lens with the gender and the uh, ethnical origin. If we were to add on top of that, you know, LGBTQ plus, and uh, you, you will see that it, it, the numbers are staggering. On the next one, we ask ourselves, you know, why is it the case? And those numbers were before COVID, so we hadn't felt the full impact. So it's not linked to attrition because actually the departure rate between men and women at the time were exactly the same, around 17%. It really has to do with two things. The first one is the broken round. The thing that, you know, for in Canada, for, have, for 100 men promoted from entry level to manager, you only have 85 women promoted. 
And actually, as you move further into the funnel, it goes down and down and down. Silver lining is that when we did this in 2019, the numbers were even starker. For 100 men promoted, you had 76 women. And another factor is the fact that when organizations do lateral hire at senior level, unfortunately, most of the time, they hire men and not women. So this attrition is further accelerated. On the next one, please, what you see is that during COVID, you know, women, it, it, it was a hardship for everybody, men and women, but women hang on this last year and they state that they are experiencing unsustainable burnout. What you see here uh, on this busy chart is the difference between 2020 and 2021. In the light blue, you have the men. In the stronger blue, you have the women. What you can see is that the percentage of employee who consistently, I'm saying not once or twice, consistently feeling burned out at work. It used to be 26% for men in 2020, which already is a lot and 29 for women, so the gap was three percentage points. If you look at 2021, it's way higher for both, 33 for men and now 39 for women, may, meaning that there is a six percentage gap between men and women. Um, and what we know is that employees who are burnt out on, on top of the fact of that it, it, is, uh, it, it is extremely sad uh, for themselves and their surrounding, are 1.6 times more likely than employees overall to have considered downshifting, leaving, and likewise consider you know, changing um, companies or organization. On the next one, please, what you have actually is one example of that. I, I told you before that um, as we did the, the research at the time, the departure rate between men and women were the same. However, what people are considering is very different. What you see here, the proportion of employees who are considering leaving or downshifting their career to a less demanding job. And uh, contrast, you know, the white with the blue, the men with the women, you can see that at entry level, a fair share of people are considering downshifting, like 30%. But as you progress in leadership, you can see that the gap between men and women increases a lot. So we have a funnel which already is, uh, is a broken rung. And on top of that, you have 35% of women in leadership, senior leadership positions saying, you know what? It's just too hard. I'm gonna step down. I'm gonna do something else. On the next one, please. Uh, what we've seen is that actually during this period, which was hard for everybody, the women leaders, they really stepped up to support employees and they invested above and beyond what was in the job description on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some facts on the next one. What you have here is, um, so let me help you navigate. What you have here is the percentage of employees uh, with women managers and the percentage of employees who say that they have a men managers. The one who have a woman managers are represented uh, in dark blue, the one with a men manager in light blue. And you have a number of dimensions, you know, does, did my manager provide emotional support? Uh, never, always, etc. Did he or she checked on uh, my overall well-being? Did he or she help me navigate my work-life challenges? Da, 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 da. And no matter the question we ask to employees, uh, you can see that the percentage of employee who said, yes, I received this support from my managers is much higher when it, these people are the woman manager than the men manager. So for instance, provided emotional support. A, it's interesting to see that the employees who are the men as a manager, only 9% of them said, you know what? My manager did provide emotional support. But the one who are the woman manager, 31% of them said, you know what? My manager, she provided me with emotional support. Meaning that the gap between men and women on this one is 12 percentage point, which is a lot. When we have about, you know, help me navigate my work-life challenges, 21% of the people who had men managers say, yes, it happened, but 26% of the ones who had women and so on and so forth. So just to say that women did step up, we ask all kinds of other questions and they all point to the same fact. During pandemic, while women were burnt out and hanging by the thread, they did spend time not only at home, but also on the workplace to help their colleagues and to help on diversity, equity and inclusion, even when it was not part of their job. On the next one, please, 
what you see is that, unfortunately, uh, they, we haven't seen enough progress on support to women. And I, I think that this one is maybe the, these are maybe the saddest slides for the, the presentation. Can you go to the next one, Devin, please? What you have here is the people reporting experiencing microaggressions. Again, same color coding, light blue men, dark blue women. And if you look at the size of the bar, you know, the blue bar are always higher than the light bar. So like being interrupted or spoken over more than other women, 26% of them said, you know what, I'm experiencing this a fair time uh, over the last uh, week, etc. This is happening to me several times per week. Uh, having other, you know, comment on appearance, again, a delta. Um, having other comment on their emotional state, again, big delta. And um, having the judgment question and their area of expertise here again, a big delta. By the way, we ask also all kinds of questions on this one. Um, and the senior women, the women in leadership position being interrupted or having the judgment question or having the legitimacy question here it's three times higher than the men. So maybe it's a good question to ask to Rania later on. You know, when you've reached the top, when you, you feel you've made it still, you can be the victim of microaggressions. The next one uh, is the one which is uh, which gives you goosebumps. Uh, it's exactly the same one than before, but on top of that, we added you know the 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 crude shift between you know white and of color. And what you see immediately, you know, is that when you are of color, uh, so that would um, you are facing much more microaggressions. If you look at, you know, the light bar, women of color, feeling, hearing or overhearing insults about their culture or people like them, 10%. Um, having the judgment question, 28% uh, of them suffer this frequently during the course of a week. Hearing other express surprise at their language skills or other abilities, it, it, it's just humongous. On this one, if you compare, you know, with the, so basically there's this sad hierarchy in a way that if you're a woman of color, you are suffer from a lot of microaggression of the course of a day. If you're a white woman, you also suffer a lot of aggression. If you're a man of color and a, a question for Homer, you also suffer from a lot of microaggression. So on the next one, uh, what can you do about that? And we decided not to share too much because we, have to, we want to have ample time for the discussion. But uh, as you can see on the next slide, unfortunately, there is no such, oh, sorry. Uh, the first and foremost is that the good news is that the employees, they see their organization prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and I am sparing you all the pages saying, you know, that it is a top priority for, actually it was for more than 80% of the companies we surveyed. Again, slight bias because the one who do nothing wouldn't have accepted to do it, but still, it is a big, big progression compared to the past years. However, when uh, it falls short is all about, you know, is it translated into action? And here, you know, um, while 68% of the people said, yes, uh, we are uh, made commitments on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which already is good to make commitments. Only 35% of the employees saying, you know what? We are taking measurable action on the commitment. And then in, if on top of that, again, it's in our report, whether the managers are being held accountable the numbers is even lower. So what to do about it? And uh, it's something that we're going to be discussing in our panel. That's on the next one. And that's going to be my last slide. And I do not intend to cover it. But uh, unfortunately, when, when we contrast to the companies, we've been doing this for 15 years, which made progress compared to the organization who haven't made any progress, we can see that, uh, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. It's a full ecosystem. And it takes time and commitment over the years to make it happen. Uh, it, it should be considered just like any change program. It starts with the commitment, the aspiration, the governance, the people processes and, pro, uh, and system, the supportive workplace, and last but not least, making, making ensuring that the environment is conducive to 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, meaning with the right mindsets and behaviors. Thank you very much. I'd like to open up to, to the panel now. Thanks so much, Sansbane, uh, for highlighting the report. Um, you know, what, what's the starkest sort of comment you made? You thought back 15 years ago that you wouldn't needed to have you wouldn't have expected to have had to have this conversation today. Um, you know, are, are we surprised by this data? Maybe, uh, Rania, I'll, I'll send it over to you on that one. Yeah, so uh, delighted to be here today. And uh, yeah, it's a little stark, but uh, to be honest, I'm not surprised. I think what really surprised me actually was when I was thinking about International Women's Day, I don't know if you know, but this is the 111th International Women's Day. So if you actually put that in perspective, Sandrine may be looking at this for the last 15 years, but we've been trying to move the dial uh, over 100 years. And the dial is moving, but it's not moving that substantially. It's not moving at that pace. And the sad part, to be honest, is I think up until a few years ago, we were always explaining the why. Why is this important? Why is diversity important? What's the PNL impact? What's the innovation? I think we only started pivoting to the how just a few years ago. And so, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. I, I personally, you know, when I'm hearing Sandrine talk, I'm like, yeah, woman, check, uh, BIPOC, so women of color, check, oh, 6% in the C-suite, yep, check, and, and being talked over, having to, like, so it's, so it's interesting actually saw, seeing it on paper because I've actually lived it, which is why it's such a personal topic to me. And I think we've done, I think, I think companies in general, and, and I'd love to, I, I'm going to open it up. Obviously, you're going to open it up to others. I think we've done a good job in terms of, again, I put it in the buckets in terms of the attract, retain, and the promote. And as I've always said, the attracting is the easy part, right? So it becomes a statistic, right? So I always say it's kind of like being invited to the party. But the inclusion part is being asked to dance, and that is a lot tougher because there's a lot of systemic issues and barriers in organizations that don't create that safe space, that inclusive space. And there's a lot of work that we all need to continue to work at to create that environment where people want to come into work, you know, and be their true authentic self. That is so um, insightful. And I did not know that this was the 111th uh, year of International Women's Day, which is, um, you know, quite the journey uh, for um, for this topic and, and for equity. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask the question then around, you know, the your commentary on the why being, you know, we all understand why now, and we go towards the how. We know that organizations are putting resources behind this issue. Like what's not working? Sandrine, you talk about the broken rung um, in a number of different spots in the funnel. What are barriers to unblocking this funnel? Uh, unfortunately, the barriers are, are multiple. And, uh, and what we've seen is that, um, and the way the organizations are tackling this topic is usually from the wrong angle. Uh, they are trying, uh, and as I said, you know, it really has to do with, you know, nobody would embark into, we're going to digitalize the corporation or, without having A, define what is the North Star, how do we define success, B, what the current diagnosis, where are we right now by business unit, by function, sub-function, by geography, uh, what, what the situation, what are, you know, the five or seven actions that makes a difference, do we have the commitment from the top management, do we have the commitment that, do we have articulated a change story that is understandable and palatable at all levels of the organization? Are we putting key performance indicator in place? Are we monitoring this? And are we incentivizing people based on that? Nobody would do that, you know, for cost cutting slash entry new geography slash whatever you name it. On this topic, somehow, it's as if, you know, we're forgetting the basics of uh, change management and change is hard. It is hard. So uh, to me, that's the number one issue that this is considered as a, a topic that you do, you know, when you have time or on the side and you do not apply, you know, proven, I would say, business recipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to, just to add to that, Sandrine, I would say from a, from a I, I do agree with you, I think, but to a certain extent, people have started putting in KPIs, but it's holding those leaders accountable. And, and as, um, one thing that I've been challenging the system for years is, 
just like you present your P&L statement on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, why wouldn't you show the reporting against diversity inclusion in that same transparent way and have those conversations? And I think, I mean, that's the one thing that we did at Laurentian Bank when I joined a year ago is, listen, we put it on the scorecards. We have KPIs. We've actually publicly announced it to the street tour analyst community in terms of here's where we're at, here's where we're going. But even in terms of presenting it to our board on a quarterly basis as part of our financial package. So let's not forget about not just the numbers, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what business we're in, we're in the people business. And so if you're not attracting the brightest and the smartest, and you're creating that environment where they can help us innovate and compete, right? It's you're, you're missing, you're missing the boat. So I think that's one aspect of it is the KPIs. Um, but I think it's also, if I could just make one comment, cause it actually hit me hard when you said the comment, women are dropping out because it's too hard. Maybe I can kind of flip it. A lot of men, when they hear that, cause I've, I've heard them say it, they can't cut it. It's too hard, but it's not for the reasons that your data is showing. It's for the reasons for all the biases in the system or how hard it is to be heard or to be spoken over, to be whacked over the head multiple times and I've experienced it personally where it's like okay in this meeting you were too aggressive the next meeting you were too quiet in the next and I'm sure many of us have experienced it where it's like I really don't know who you want me to be and what does leadership look like so I think I think we need to be very careful with words as well because then people hang their hats and say it's too hard so I, d I just wanted to comment on that. I'm sure Homer wants to jump in. No, no, as well. I will let Homer answer, but just to be very precise, Rania, on this one, I fully agree with you, actually. In, if you read all the research, we found out that um, maybe just, I just want to make sure that it, this is a very important statement. So uh, let's get the facts right. And sorry if I was not clear. Number one, what we found out is that by and large, women have the same level of ambition than men. It's been demonstrated over and over by us, by others. Number two, they, they, they do want to reach the top. Again, we demonstrated this in all our report. Number three, they do say that when we focus on the woman who said, I want to reach the top, which by the way, is not all the women, so we, but we focus on this one. What we found out, uh, the big difference was the, the one who said, and I am confident or I am not confident. And why women are confident, very often we believe that it is because uh, they lack confidence in themselves. Actually, that's not what we demonstrated. And it's exactly in line with what Rania just said. What we demonstrated is that the confidence has to do with elements which are linked to their surroundings. Do, mm -hmm. Are they confident that the environment in which they operate is conducive to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And that's what makes the biggest level of confidence. It's not like, you know, I'm confident in my ability. Yes, it plays a part. But the most important driver is do I believe that the organization in which I operate are supporting this? Do I believe that the managers are supporting this? Da, 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 da. And what we're saying this year is that on top of everything, which is very much in line with right, with COVID, which was in particular for the people, you know, the caretaker, the people in charge of family, et cetera, that's been an extra hurdle for women. And they are saying, you know, more than men that they, they just, but this is, I would say, specific to COVID. And I, I will... Stop speaking and hand the mic to Omer. <laughs> thank, thank you. And, uh, and I just wanted to add that uh, I think I heard Rania say, and I agree with this, is that we need to stop making excuses. I think uh, the data is compelling, but there's always the, uh, the natural inclination to make excuses. And I work at a publicly funded organization, so we often give ourselves lots of leeway for a variety of reasons, including lack of funding uh, and other things. As a healthcare organization, we've had two years of the pandemic where we say we actually can't focus on anything else except for the pandemic and our direct COVID response. But I think to both of your points, getting through the pandemic, you know, excelling as an organization is about supporting our people. And I think the DEI initiatives are fundamental to supporting our people. And as, as Sandrine's report shows, uh, women have really stepped up, particularly to offer support during the pandemic. And so, and I've seen that in my own organization. And so if we don't support them uh, so that they feel included, they feel valued, I think we will disproportionately lose women, women of color, and it'll weaken our uh, organizations as we go into pandemic recovery mode. Uh, 
very insightful, um, all each of you. Um, is there anything that is working? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Homer, I'll send that one back to you to start with. Sure. I mean, I think it might be a bit premature to say that anything is working, especially when we look at uh, the data in the report. I mean, I, you know, we are focused on outcomes and whatever processes we've established or were established previously as a whole, we clearly haven't achieved our desired outcome. I am hopeful, though, that I mean, there are some initiatives that uh, I'm hoping can lead to change that, that we've looked at. And I think one of the things about excuses is we have to categorically say there are, there are no more excuses. And uh, so, you know, it can't be the pandemic, it can't be for lack of funding, it can't be we're too busy. I think we, we leaders need to first explicitly say, you know, this is a huge priority. This is the priority uh, moving forward. And uh, as Rania said, we need to uh, identify our outcomes and, and be accountable for achieving them. I think uh, when we look at DEI, then how do we support DEI um, at Orange? We've recruited two leads, uh, and of course, they're women who've stepped up. But as you can imagine, we're a little tight for money, but we need to value this work. And so it's, it's imperative that this work is compensated appropriately and valued, and that there's an appropriate reporting structure. And so I think we've uh, tried to ensure that uh, that they have the appropriate support direct directly to to the CEO's office and they have direct access so that their recommendations aren't ignored and uh, they're fully supported. And I think we, you know, the other thing I'm proud about that we're trying to move forward creatively is we're trying to incorporate uh, DEI in our hiring and performance evaluation processes. I think we all know that best practices are about trying to mitigate hiring bias or evaluative biases. And, you know, they include things like structured interview questions and ensuring the selection committee is diverse and so forth. But I think we have to look at our own organizations because each of our organizations are unique and they have special features that sort of make you have to think about your own organization. Like classic study from 2000, you know, blinded auditions for symphony musicians uh, led to uh, more uh, women musicians at the, the major symphonies. At Orange, we have medical and paramedical staff, and we have air crew. And you know, we have to think about what are the particular nuances of how we uh, evaluate. And you know, for aircraft crew, when we haven't implemented it, implemented this yet, but we have computer programs that evaluate how pilots fly about with certain safety parameters, and and you know, uh, without bias, score their flying. And so, when we're hiring like a new safety pilot. This data would be an unbiased way of looking at, you know, how compliant they are with safety and how, how, how they value safety. So I think we each have to think about the best ways to use non-biased evaluative structures. Mm -hmm. That's great. So maybe I can add just a few things in terms of, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Homer, just in terms of, uh, you know, your HR processes and so on. Um, one, one way we've tackled it slightly differently at Laurentian Bank is it's not standalone. Everybody is responsible for ED&I, right? And so it's the tone, and I agree with you, Homer, it's the tone from the top. Um, and I think the, the systemic uh, systems that have been resolved around, you know, just in terms of uh, diverse panels and resumes and so on, that's great from an attraction perspective. And I think we've all done a good job at that. It's really the retention, development, and promotion that we need more work on. And so, and that's how, that's, that's the harder work. And that's where you need men and women. Because historically, what I've seen is women are the first people that put their hand up, similar to what Sundreen said in her report, that are like, okay, we're going to support this DNI initiative. And I'm like, but I'm already a woman. I need the men and the others, the diverse groups, to be the allies for this, you know, to champion this going forward, right? And so some of the things that we've done at Laurentian Bank, we introduced a Courageous Conversation series because you can't solve the problem until you actually walk in someone else's shoes. And so uh, just like I'll never know what it's like to be Homer, Homer will never know what it's like to be Rania. But I think if we sit down and start having these courageous conversations, so create these safe environments where our, our people can come together to truly learn and understand the day-to-day -day challenges. 
So when you say this, this is how this makes me feel. Like I've heard it many times where it's like, you know what, Rania, you're one of the boys. And I'm like, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Because I'm not really sure, right? So, but someone saying it is probably coming from a very kind place, but doesn't understand the impact it has. So we started that and then we created employee resource groups. So they're actually employee led. And we did one for black, uh, for the black community. We've done one for stronger for women. We've done one for the LGBTQ plus, but they are sponsored by an executive at my C-suite. So again, there's someone at the top who is responsible and accountable and they are the champion. So I think it's like what Sandrine said, you need a top down, bottom up approach and you need to keep talking about it. Um, and so I think it's really important. And then obviously unconscious bias training is important. And then having that North Star and, and embedding it in the organization. So one of our key strategic pillars that we have is make the better choice and make the better choice. And our tagline is seeing beyond numbers. So it's not, we're not just here for numbers. You're not an employee is a number. So you're an individual. And so let's start, stop trying to stereotype people. Like, why do I have to fit in any one bucket? Why can't I just be me? And so, but it starts by learning and understanding. And I think it's really important as leaders to create that very safe environment that we can hear those stories come out because that's the only way we're going to be able to tackle it. So I, I fully agree. Oh, sorry. Just to build on what Omer and Rania said, um, if you look over a long period of time across the world, number one, I mean, the numbers are moving and they are moving in the right direction. Uh, in, in Canada, which was, as I said, already in the top 10 country in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think the urge is more like, let's not rest on our laurels because we're not there, by the way. So that was just an urge to action for Canada. But overall, worldwide, it is moving. It is moving, you know, from diversity to diversity at large. It is moving uh, gender diversity to diversity at large. It is moving, as Rania said, from only pure numbers to equity and inclusion. It is also, I mean, the number of corporations organiza slash organizations which report they are serious about that went from like below 40% when I started doing it to more like 80 plus percent. The numbers, I mean, Rania said, you know, kind of I'm sick and tired about the why, let's go to the what. But the good news is that people at least understood the why. So like now, you know, top managers and even senior managers, they say, you know, it's not something only fair to do and equitable. It is something which has to be done it, 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 for business purposes. It's not an opposition. It's not a polarity. It's not, you know, either I do COVID, I treat COVID in the hospital or I'm diverse. No, you can maybe treat, not maybe, you can treat COVID better and achieve your mission while being diverse. And the last thing I would like to say is that in terms, and people are now aware of the difficulties people of minorities are facing on their way to the top. When I started, you know, we asked questions such as even only five or six years ago in Western Europe, uh, with equal qualification and skill, it is harder for women to reach the top. We asked the same question, it is harder for people of color to reach the top. More than 70% of the middle managers in Europe said, no, it's not. And I think that's why we need to communicate, communicate, communicate again and again and show the fact because it is harder. And the more diverse you are, the hard dust or whatever, check my English, it is. It's more and more hard. So that's why it, it, it is very important. So things are moving in the right direction. More and more organizations are taking stances, but we cannot let, you know, leave our foot off the pedal. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not because you have COVID or uh, war or whatever that you must put your eye off this ball, because we know that the progress takes year to achieve. It is, it is very hard to move systems. Um, so it is uh, incredibly important to, to keep our foot on the pedal um, and to not rest on the successes to date. Um, you are, you're actually all answering questions that are, are already coming through. Um, you know, there was a question on initiatives that are currently underway in your firms, which um, you know, you've all talked about. Um, as a reminder to our audience, if you do have questions, please post them. Uh, we'll hopefully leave a little bit of time at the end um, for, for a bit of back and forth Q and A. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of move into, uh, this conversation around, you know, we've mentioned the pandemic on this call. It's been the great accelerator, a great amplifier. We know, we know that it's hit women particularly hard as the data has shown, you know, as we look ahead, um, to, to, 
where leaders have an opportunity to create new future of work models. What advice do you have for them? Maybe, Rania, I, I know you're passionate about this topic, so maybe I'll, I'll send it to you first. Yeah, I, I think I'm passionate about this topic because I, I left an institution that I was with for 26 years in the middle of a pandemic to join an institution and to lead it in the middle of a pandemic, uh, not knowing a single soul and uh, working from home. And so uh, I've lived it, I've experienced it. Uh, and I kind of joke around, I've been running a bank for the last 15 months out of my kitchen table in my house, uh, where my kids are like, Mom, Wait, I need to use the kids? blender. I was yeah, about my, to say, well, 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 they're back to school now. They're back to school now. But they're like, can I use the blender? Uh, because I and I'm like, I'm on a call right now. Uh, so and so when people challenge me on how do you change culture, how do you build culture in, in, from a remote perspective, I beg to show them that we've been able to move the dial, but you need a different type of leader, uh, different leadership skills to actually manage a hybrid or a remote workforce. You know, the traditional way of leading has been, you know, walking the floors, you know, colliding with people that you like, going for lunch, giving them those special uh, projects and so on. And so I actually think that this has created an equalizer because you you have to get to know each of your team members a little bit more intimately and proactively reach out to them. And so you can have more intimate and detailed conversations about career developments, aspirations, and so on. The challenge is going to be the hybrid model where you're going to have some in the office and some outside of the office. So at Laurentian, to be honest, we took a very different, bold approach relative to our other peer group. We decided, and I challenged my leadership team, and we all agreed, or we were up to the challenge, why don't we start with a work from home first culture, and then let's figure out what do we need an office for, right? Because as humans, we've been working from home now for almost three years. So our schedules have all changed, right? Like, you know, I like to kind of work out and maybe shower at lunchtime, which means that in the morning, I'm probably wearing a ball cap or a sweatshirt, depending on who I'm meeting with. So our, you know, everyone's kind of styles have changed. And so bringing them back is going to be really, really hard for it to actually be mandated. So we decided to do that. And we actually gave up 50%. We committed to giving up 50% of our corporate space from a real estate perspective. And so, and that was based on a survey that we conducted. And what's interesting is I was interviewed recently and they were like, oh, well, that's more for women. And I said, no, over 80% of our staff said, and they're both men and women, they would rather have a flexible work arrangement. So for us, it was more of a retention strategy, but also an attraction opportunity. So attracting a whole new talent. So now I'm not limited by geography. And so we can hire anywhere uh, across the country or ac across the globe if it's the right fit and it's the right talent that we need. So you open up a whole new thing. So we are actually using it as a competitive advantage, but I do think for both men and women, who want to play a more active role with their kids, who want to uh, contribute to their communities, who want to, you know, different, they, they want to be able to balance, have a little bit more, and I don't believe in full work-life balance, but a little bit more, I guess, in control of their time. I think it does create opportunities for women. Because historically, listen, if you weren't in the office and you had to run to go pick up your kid from daycare as a woman, like you were like stressed out. All the men are still in the office. My boss won't see me. So FaceTime equated to productivity. And so I think that has been an equalizer, but the mindset in management needs to change. And, that, and I think that's what we're looking for is to retrain our leaders. Just because you want to go back to the office doesn't necessarily mean your team wants to go back. And then what are the skills that you need to be able to create that equal opportunity for people uh, that are either working from home or in the office or in a hybrid setting. That's wonderful. Um, I can certainly attest to all, everything that you just talked about <laughs> happened to me over the last two and a half years. Um, and you know the mindset shift and you know the working from working from home. The worst the worst comment I had heard through this entire piece was when you're at home you're not working. Let's go back to yeah. work. We have all been working. We have all been working probably two times harder than we have historically. Um, I don't know, uh, Sandrine, Homer, any, any thoughts on that, on, on future of work in your organizations as well? Sure, uh, I'll uh, comment. I think uh, certainly uh, at the uh, corporate head office, uh, we, the uh, flexible work at home policy is, is absolutely critical from a 
a retention point of view and attraction. I think we're a little different in that as a frontline healthcare organization, we also have people who have to show up at work. And one of the challenges I think from the pandemic is that um, you see a differentiation uh, by gender sometimes about reasons for why you have to be off work, right? And I think, you know, a family emergency, a fa you know, a need to isolate at home to look after the kids. And there might be uh, a difference between which, you know, is it the, uh, the mother or the father who stays at home as a paramedic uh, who's supposed to staff an ambulance. And I think there's some sort of unconscious bias that we say when people don't show up for work. And I think as leaders, we have to ensure that we have uh, like the appropriate staffing ratios, for example, to be to allow our, our workers to have the ability to look after the families. And so we have some reserves to call people up. So we're, you know, a lot of our public funded organizations are, we're staffed at sort of uh, thin margins, so to speak, right, with not a lot of reserve. And so we have to make a compelling argument as to why, you know, if we want to support our people to, uh, to not feel uh, so that they don't feel like they can't look after their families if their child has to be isolated because of school, if they have the ability to put up their hand and that there's support from the organization level. And I think that's something that we've noticed a lot of during the pandemic, and we want to move forward on that going, uh, going into the future. Mm -hmm. I'd like to build on what Omer and Rania said, because in our report, we clearly showed, and, and, and Omer said it, that uh, there are differences in terms of gender. And we asked people, you know, in the next normal, how, how often would you like to be in the office? And we had one day, two day, three day, all the way to five days a week. And if you look at the two curve, the men compared to the women, by and large, the women are like, I'd like to be in the office less than two, day, two days a week. And the men are like, I'd like to be in the office more like about four to five days a week. So the curves are completely opposite, meaning that, uh, A, I fully agree that during COVID, we demonstrated that, you know, we keep, keep on being productive even more while being at home. But B, in this hybrid model or in this new normal, how do we make sure that we keep on being inclusive and that mm -hmm. the one who want not to be in the office are not, um, and we know that they're mostly the, the women, are not forgotten. forgotten. So that's not a very- penalized. Exactly, yeah. not penalized because, um, so I think that, and I really liked what, uh, and congratulations for Rania for doing that, but the thing that, you know, let us rethink like we are, we are out of the office by principle and let's think about why do we need to be together? Uh, I think this, that must happen at the global level, I mean, corporation organization level, must also happen, I think, at the level of each individual. What matters? What do I need to attend to make sure that I do not lose my connectivity? We know also that by and large, people uh, you know, of minorities, they are far less uh, allies, sponsors than others. Um, so. Mm. In, purpose, in person with purpose, um, I think is, actually, is the strategy. Um, let me let me shift a little bit to to advice. Um, you three are, are senior leaders at the top of your game. I'm seeing a few questions come through that you know focus on like folks just wanting advice on on how to approach um, uh, you know their careers early mid careers. What do you have? You know what what guidance might you have for them? Maybe I'll I'll throw it to um, Sandrine to start with. The first one would be you know don't quit before you quit. Mm. Uh, the, the, the number of people who want to quit instead of experiencing, you know, if there are things A, B, C, D that you do not like, try to change them and then, you know, don't quit before you quit. And I, unfortunately, I do believe that uh, many women, they quit before they quit, you know, I mean, they just don't want to try. And I mean, we, we've seen, you know, that what we held as being true is not true anymore. So this is the moment for invention, etc., for trial. So that my, my one advice would be don't quit before you quit. Mm. That's right. Rania, throw it over to you. You're limiting it to one. That's going to be oh. hard, Sandrine. Sandrine, you stuck to one. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think, listen, early on, um, I think understand self-awareness is really, really important. I think that's a very important leadership skill, but I, even early on in your career to understand the cultural fit. So you know, the culture under which you need, you, you need 
to have in order for you to thrive. Mm-hmm. And I, I unfortunately learned that early on in my career where there was a mismatch in cultural fit. And, uh, and then I was given 90 days notice to find another job. And, and, and Sandrine, it was actually female, female leaders who did not support me. And so that's why I always say, let's not put stereotypes. Some of the best leaders I've had have been women and some of the best have been men and, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. But I think understand being self-aware and cultural fit early on because your boss can make you or break you so early on in your career. From a mid, 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 mid career perspective, again, I think it goes back to self-awareness and that comment you said earlier, Sandrine, in terms of confidence, knowing what you want. And so what I tell people is no one gets out of bed thinking about your career every day, except you. So you really need to own your career and your drive and where you want to go. So take chances, right? Take risks. So that's one of the things like during COVID when I was trying to recruit for my C-suite, to be honest, and I think I had that conversation with you, Sandrine, before, I was a little disappointed with how many women wanted to jump ship, join my C-suite in a transformational. So yes, lots of risks associated with it, but what a great opportunity to reshape your career, right? Men were more likely to put their hands up. So I think we need more, we need women to take more courageous leaps, right? and believe in themselves that they can actually do something, you know, bigger and better. And so I would say definitely be courageous and take risks. I love it. I love it. Um, Homer, what about, what about it as an ally, as, as a male leader in, in your organization, what advice do you have? I think uh, one of the things I would say is it's important to be authentic. I, I, you know, as growing up as a person of color, it's, there is always microaggressions, macroaggressions, and I think when you try to change too much, it it uh, takes a toll on you as you go through your life and your career. And and I wonder if uh, you know Sandrine's findings that uh, women start leaving the pipeline uh, for different reasons is sometimes I think these microaggressions play a toll if you keep if you're not authentic to yourself. So I think it's important to to be authentic to yourself, but then as, uh, as leaders, as male leaders, particularly allyship is important to recognize that people come from different backgrounds. A woman's experience is very different from a, a man's in many instances, and we need to be respectful and uh, inclusive of that and supportive. Wonderful, thank you. Thank That's you. Um, I am going to take, I think we have time for one question before um, we close out, uh, and so many great questions have surfaced here. Um, what, um, let's see here, Let, let's go to this one. Is there one thing we can all do today when we finish the event, this event, to support d at work, even if it's something small? So individuals, not, not just leaders, but us as individuals as well. Um, Maybe, uh, so, yeah, Rania? I was just going to jump in just because I think we're running out of time. I was going to say, you know, share your story or, or go and reach out to somebody who may be a woman from a diverse background and ask them to share their story. I, I think it really starts with that real, you know, authentic want to learn more. Uh, I think that's one thing that you can start with because that's, that's, that's the beginning of that conversation, that journey. Homer, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd like to echo that. And, you know, when I was thinking of last night, I was in the operating room and I was working with a a female surgical resident and a a male uh, person of color. And, you know, I was thinking about today and I just asked them about their experiences. And, and, you know, you're you're often quite surprised at what people are experiencing today. And we we had a long conversation after the, the case was done about, their personal experiences. And it, it really surprised me at what, what's happening with regards to how, how included people feel and some of the microaggressions that uh, people are still experiencing. Mm, acknowledgement and just really understanding the, the people that we work with um, as, a, as a foundational piece. Sandrine, any? Uh, I would use two. The first one was be an ally find some people who are different. I mean, for me, it's natural to be a lot of women, but you know, many, I mean, diversity is way wider than gender diversity. So find, be an ally to somebody who is, you wouldn't have put in your radar screen. And the second one is uh, be aware of your biases, even your own biases. Um, 
um, uh, I realized after having studied all these years, etc., I have all kinds of questionnaires and on a number of dimensions, I have biases. And I do say things and I do um, sometimes think things when I, oh my God. So I think that you, you're never done on this topic. Mm. And Aware. it's always very useful to have people, you know, kind of check on you. And uh, mm -hmm. if you suddenly say, you know what, when you said that, that was the impact of like, oh my God, it is a journey. It is be may, maybe also mm -hmm. kind with you because it's a journey and nobody has cracked the code, but it's just like, are you on the journey and are you trying yourself to improve? I think that would be the number one. Mm, wonderful. Awareness of self, awareness of our colleagues mm. um, and openness, um, really, really powerful. Um, that, I mean, that, I can't believe how quickly this conversation went, I have to be honest with you. Um, I know we're, we're already at five to the top. Um, before I hand it over to uh, Khadija to, to close us out, just a reminder for everyone who registered for uh, this, um, uh, this session today, uh, there will be a link sent out with the McKinsey report, the full report that Sandrine uh, walked us through at the beginning at a very, very high level. Um, and with that, over to you, Khadija, to, to close us off. Hello, hello, folks. You couldn't see me, but I was like so excited and smiling the whole way through. So like allyship, go meet people, all of that stuff. As someone who's super earlier on in her career, I will be taking note. You sending those coffee invitations and, and ready to hear all of that sponsorship, mentorship advice. So thank you so much for joining us today in celebration for International Women's Day. My name is Khadija Wasim and I'm a director of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Sandrine, Rania, and Homer, thank you so much for the time, for taking the time to join us, to share your experiences, your authentic stories, your authentic selves, your wisdom, and your achievements. Because it's super, super exciting listening to those as well with myself and everyone listening today. Chisen, thank you so much for your expert guidance on today's discussion. And thank you again once more to our sponsors, Canadian Bankers Association and McKinsey. We appreciate your generous support of today's discussion. Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeetings.ca for making it possible for us to gather virtually today. And we hope you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow, March 9th, we host the Honorable Stephen Gobu, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, for a conversation on the market shift towards green investing and clean innovation. The Government of Canada's first upcoming emission reduction plan. There's still time to register for virtual tickets, and on Thursday the 10th, we host a virtual panel on building Canada's net zero workforce. This discussion will feature business leaders across sectors, including Charlene Gale, Chief of Fort Nelson First Nation, Linda Hassenfratz, CEO of Lenamar, and John Kusuneris, CEO of TransAlta. To, to learn more about our upcoming events, explore our website at canadianclub.org, browse our rich archive of past events, and check out our new updated mentorship membership categories with enhanced benefits at a variety of levels. Please consider becoming a member to support our club's work. Hope you're able to share your little tidbits and nuggets from today's conversation on social media. Follow us and once again, yes, thank you so much for joining us. Please stay healthy and safe.